Seven steps to casting out demons. These are going to be the best seven steps I've ever given, the most basic I've ever given, the most practical. And this is for all of you new people, all of you small groups, all of you churches, all of you getting into it, or all of you that have been in it. I'm going to give you the practical steps, the exact way that we're going to from beginning to end in the simplest way possible, because the last time I did this was 10 steps, which is way too complicated, to cast out a demon. Step number one, make sure the person is a believer and they want deliverance. Okay, make sure they're a believer. Step one, make sure they're a believer and they want deliverance. Mark 7, 24 and Matthew 15, 21, a woman came to Jesus begging for her daughter to be delivered. The problem was she wasn't eligible because she was a Greek. And Jesus said, let the children first be filled. I shall not cast the children's bread to the dogs. The children's bread was speaking of deliverance because remember, she came to Jesus saying, I need deliverance. Jesus said, I'm not going to give you what belongs to my people, to the children, the children's bread, okay? She responds, even the dogs sit under the table and eat the children crumbs. He said, for this, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. So Jesus identifies in these passages, deliverance is the children's bread. It's for the people of God. She was not an Israelite and therefore not considered God's people. And so Jesus ignored her request and said, this is not for you, but because of her persistence and her faith, her faith qualified her to be a true daughter of Abraham and to be able to be accounted for her faith and to receive deliverance. So her faith was put on display and her daughter's deliverance followed. Faith is important in deliverance. You have to understand this. If the person getting delivered doesn't have the faith to be delivered, they're not gonna get delivered. So when people are like, I don't believe in deliverance, deliver me then. That's not gonna work. That's not how deliverance works. You need to be wanting it. Even if you read the gospels, everybody that got delivered wanted to be delivered. They put themselves in a position, whether they were in the synagogue, even the man at the tombs came to Jesus. Jesus did not go to him. He came to Jesus, got on his knees and cried out, what do you want from us? So even the man at the tombs, the Syrophoenician woman came to Jesus. The man at the Mount of Transfiguration came to Jesus saying, please deliver my boy. So you got to realize that there was a desire in these people to be delivered. Luke 13, she was in a synagogue and got delivered. So there needs to be a desire to get deliverance. They need to be a desire for them to want deliverance. Do not do deliverance on people that don't want it and don't do deliverance on an unbeliever. Not only is it hard enough to do deliverance on a believer, but unbelievers, there's no point doing deliverance on them because of Matthew 12, 43. It says this, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds no rest. This is Jesus speaking, verse 44. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds that house empty, swept and put in order. But notice it says empty there. Then he goes and takes himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first state of the man. So it shall be with this wicked generation. So Jesus says, listen, if the house stays empty and Jesus is obviously talking about where the house, if the house, which we are spiritual houses, according to Jesus stays empty, then the demons come back. So if you're doing deliverance on an unbeliever, what's the point? The house is empty. They can't be full of Jesus because they're not a believer and the demons just come back worse. Not only that, if you do deliverance on an unbeliever, the demons don't have to leave. They have a legal right to be there. And I'm gonna say this, and I know I'm gonna ruffle a bunch of feathers, it's okay. Every single deliverance ministry I know of, every single one, and I know a lot of them, do deliverance only on believers. I don't know one deliverance ministry that does deliverance on unbelievers. Every one of them would agree deliverance is for the body of Christ. It's for the children's bread. The person getting delivered needs to want freedom. Now you might say, well, Isaiah, what about, I've seen people do it on the streets. I've seen people cast demons out of people that didn't want it. You didn't probably see them cast the demon out. You probably saw the person manifest. Now you can go to an unbeliever at any point and say, I command these demons to come out and they're going to start screaming, growling, manifesting, but being a, manifesting a demon doesn't mean a demon leaves. Okay. So don't mistake a person manifesting a demon with a demon actually leaving a person. It's a big difference. And I've never seen a demon leave an unbeliever. And I've watched video after video after video. I've been around this for a long time. I have never seen a demon leave an unbeliever and they've gone back to being an unbeliever. Deliverance is absolutely for the believer. Those that are serving God and that want freedom. Those are the children's bread. They're eligible for deliverance. So the person needs to be a believer. They need to want their freedom and they need to participate. So make sure the person doesn't just sit there. 
They need to help you out. Make sure you tell them, hey, you need to want this more than I want this. You need to help me in this deliverance, okay? So once that qualification has been met, step number two, now this is how you're gonna start. You're gonna lead them through renouncing, dealing with unforgiveness, and verbally saying, the demons must leave me, okay? Write that down. So number two, lead them through renouncing, deal with unforgiveness, and have them verbally say, these demons must leave me because the demons need to know the person doesn't want it. Now, what is renouncing? Renounce simply means I'm going to keep this as basic as possible because I don't want to overcomplicate it. Renounce basically says you're denying it and you no longer want it. You're cutting ties with it. And the reason why we do this is because remember, the demons are there because you invited them there. They're not there by accident. You didn't trip over the demon that came into you. Demons are there because you opened up a door, you accepted them, you gave them a legal right, you came in agreement with them, and you gave them permission to be there. So what you're doing when you renounce it or repent, you can use either word. Some people are like, I don't like the word renounce. Then use the word repent. You're breaking the legal right the demon has to be there. Now, sometimes the demon will say, you can't cast me out. I don't have to leave. This person's my home. They want me here. I have a legal right to be there. These are lies, okay? It's as simple as this. What does it look like practically? It looks like them saying, I renounce sickness. I renounce lust. I renounce perversion, I renounce divorce, I renounce addiction, I renounce witchcraft, I renounce hate, I renounce cursing. You're just gonna lead them through renouncing. Now, sometimes they'll stop at a certain word, like if they say, I renounce witchcraft, and they start choking, or the demon won't let them say it, then you're on to something, okay? Take note that if the demon doesn't want them to renounce something, there's probably a demon behind that sin. So you need to take note on that because that's something that can help you start the deliverance right after they renounce. Remember, the power is in the tongue. The power of life and death is in the tongue. Our weapons are supernatural. We use our tongues. The Bible says what we bind on earth shall be bound in the heavenlies. What we loose on earth shall be loosed in the heavenlies. The way that we loose and bind is through our words. It is the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you got to remember the mouth brings a confession. The confession brings the deliverance. Your words change things in the spiritual realm. So that's why it's dangerous for you to be saying stupid stuff because your words change things in the spiritual realm. So this is the time where you're renouncing. Then after I renounce, what do we do? Unforgiveness. Make sure there's no unforgiveness there. Unforgiveness gives demons legal right to torment people. Remember, Jesus said, if you have unforgiveness, I'll turn you over to the tormentors or the torturers. So that gives demons legal right to be there. Unforgiveness becomes something that the demons hang on to. 2 Corinthians 2.10 says, but to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For what I also have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything for your sakes, I have forgiven it in the presence of Christ that no advantage may be gained over you by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So he says, forgive, or Satan will have an advantage over you. So it's major, unforgiveness is major. It's the most common reason why demons are there, demons don't leave. You need to make sure the person wants to forgive. I've had hours and hours of sessions where an hour, two hours go in, the person says, I'm not gonna forgive my dad. The demon says that I'm not leaving, and I've yelled at it, we've done everything we can but the demon hangs on to the unforgiveness. So you need to make sure most important is you deal with the unforgiveness. Okay, so you've dealt with the renouncing, you've dealt with the unforgiveness. Step number three, are you ready? Confront the demon, confront the demon. This is the number one reason why people don't get deliverance is because no one's willing to confront the demon. So you need to confront, demons must be confronted. You need to call them out. You need to put pressure on them, okay? Ask the person as you're calling it out, are you hearing anything? Are you feeling anything? Don't be afraid to ask questions in deliverance. It's usually at this point, the person will start manifesting. Well, what does the manifesting mean? It means to bring something to light. It means to make something clear to the eye or the mind. It means to make something that was unknown be known, okay? So demons are hiding in darkness, they're unknown, and when we call them out, they manifest, and now they're brought to the open and they're made known. What does manifesting look like? Growling, coughing, screaming, eyes rolling back, um, foaming at the mouth, vomiting, uh, what else? Confusion, somebody looking like they're fall over dead, which I'll show you that in scripture. These are all manifestations of demonic spirits. Anger is a manifestation. If you're doing deliverance, you start seeing them clench, clench their fist. That could be a spirit of anger and be careful because they will, they will start getting crazy. So depending on the demon depends on the demon's personality and their attributes, but just know that's the point where the demon will usually manifest. How do I confront the demon? You start calling it out. So it's simple as I bind the spirit of anger, come out now. We know you're there. I always tell demons, we know you're there. We're not playing around, we're not playing games. Talk to them like they're little kids. We know you're there and you're going to come out in Jesus' name. You start putting pressure on them. 
and they're not able to hide. So that's what you need to do. Now, people come to me every time I do deliverance and say, I've been in church my whole life. I've never manifested. I've never been delivered. Why now? Because no one ever confronted your demons. No one ever confronted those spirits. Nobody ever called those demons out. Yes, yawning is another manifestation. Okay, so that's what you need to do is you need to confront the demon. I was in New York just a week ago. A lady came up to me. She said, Isaiah, I'm at the top of my career. I could tell she was successful. She was a businesswoman. And she said, nobody knows, but I've been having nonstop thoughts of suicide, anxious anxiety attack stress I don't know what to do I've been in church my whole life I start praying for her within three minutes she starts speaking in a man's voice growling at me screaming at me what do you want from me why are you doing this I hate you we're not leaving her she's our home she was manifesting within three minutes of me calling those demons out so you got to know your authority put pressure on the demon and you need to confront the demon then they're gonna start manifesting a couple ways to make a demon manifest um, call them out, put pressure on them. Let them know that the person's not your their home. Plead the blood of Jesus against them. Pray the fire of God against them. Anoint the person with oil. Um, sometimes anointed atmospheres make demons manifest. The presence of God, if it's strong at an altar or at a service, the manifest presence of God is strong. It'll also make the demons manifest. Okay, you have to remember, demons have never met someone like you. They've never met a believer with authority that has authority like you that's going to call them out. Most people that are demonized have never met a believer that's going to call them out. So demons are comfortable in churches. I preached that last week in New York. Demons are comfortable in churches because they don't get called out and it's time for us to start calling them out. So you need to understand that when we call them out, usually that's going to manifest uh welcome el ray to the block list thank you very much okay so you need to call them out you need to make that's also how they manifest they can also manifest while renouncing a lot of times as they're renouncing or dealing with unforgiveness the demon's going to start manifesting worship music will also make them manifest they'll start getting uncomfortable so just go ahead and go at it go at it don't be afraid um now you might say well what do i do if the person doesn't manifest could keep putting pressure on the demon play worship music have a five to 10 minute prayer time or a little break there. Um, come back at another time if they really just don't manifest, nothing happens. Or the last thing would be conclude that they don't have a demon. Not every single person, I would say majority of people do have demons that have never been delivered, but not every single person has a demon. So if you spend 30 minutes, 40 minutes, there's no manifestation, there's nothing, they don't hear anything, they don't feel anything, there's no like crawling in their chest or crawling in their stomach, then you may be able to conclude they don't have a demon. But be very careful by telling someone you don't have a demon, okay? Because people that do have a demon, you tell them they don't have a demon, then they never seek deliverance and they struggle their whole life. So I'm very leery on telling someone that really believes they need deliverance, they don't need deliverance. Okay, um, now can you stop someone from manifesting? Absolutely. The way to stop a manifestation, write this down, is to call them out by name. Call them out by name. Just command it to stop and whatever their name is, Michael, Terry, Jacob, whatever, say, I want to speak to Jacob, not the demon. And I command Jacob to come to Jacob. I want to talk to you. And then usually the demon will stop manifesting and you can talk to the person. So if you need to stop it, if it's not an opportune time or not the right time, or you need to schedule another deliverance, don't be afraid. A lot of times when they start manifesting, we're afraid to stop the demon. It's not, don't worry. You could stop the manifestation and bring it back up at another time. But those are just some ways the demons manifest. Now, I know where you're going to ask, can you get delivered without manifesting? Yes. Our goal is not to make you manifest, it's to set you free. Now, I would say the majority of the time when a demon's coming out or you're casting out a demon, the person does manifest, but it's not every, it doesn't have to always be that way. Remember in Luke chapter 13, there was a girl that was demonized that got delivered and there was no manifestation of her getting delivered, but she did get delivered. So there doesn't have to be a manifestation. Some people, you'll literally pray and they'll just feel it come out of the top of their head. They'll feel it come out of their ear. They'll feel it come out of their mouth, out of their nose, wherever way it comes out. Usually it comes out of the mouth, but there's different ways that it comes out. So yes, manifestations are not required, but they are, I would say 90 plus percent of the time they manifest. Um, okay, number four. So that was number three, and I'll recap all of them at the end here. Number four, bind the demon in Jesus' name, command them to go into the abyss, okay? So this is what you're going to do. You're confronting the demon. I bind you. I command you to come out, and you're binding the demon, and you're commanding it to go into the abyss. The Bible says we have the power to bind and to loose. Now, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of information where to send demons. Why do we send them into the abyss? I'm going to show you why. Luke 8.31, the King James Version says the demons beg Jesus not to send them back into the deep or into the abyss. So this is the only place in scripture 
where we know the demons don't want to go to the abyss. So if the demons beg Jesus, don't send us there, then that's the safest place to send them because Jesus doesn't tell us where to send them. So I send them to the abyss. I believe it's a safe place. Re Romans 10, 7 says the abyss is the place of the dead. Revelation 17 says the Antichrist will rise out of the abyss. Revelation 20 says the abyss is where Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years before being let out again. Revelation 9 describes the abyss as an area under the earth that has a shaft where smoke comes out of the earth like a furnace. Um, so my personal belief is this, okay? And this is my personal belief, and this is how I do deliverance. Demons that we cast out, they don't go back into circulation. That's a pointless to cast them out of one person, so they go into another person. Demons that are cast into the abyss, they go into the abyss, which is under the earth, and they wait in the abyss until judgment, because we know demons will be judged. They told Jesus, have you come to judge us before the time? So demons will receive judgment, and the abyss is the waiting place that demons go until they are judged. Now, according to Revelation 20, all the demons are going to be one day thrown in the lake of fire and they're going to be in their own torment, okay? So I believe the abyss and the pit is the safest place to send them. Now, I know because I've read books of other teachings. I know one guy, he says, I lock them, I send them into locked boxes and send them to the feet of Jesus. I don't do that personally. I think that's I don't know. I don't have any, there's no biblical backing for putting demons in boxes and taking them to the feet of Jesus. I don't know why demons would want to go to, or we'd want to send demons to heaven, which if you didn't know, Jesus is in heaven biblically. He's at the right hand of the father. He's forever making intercession for us. So I wouldn't send them in boxes. I wouldn't send them to Jesus. Now, some people say, well, I send demons to Jesus. He knows what to do with them. I just command them to go into the abyss. I've had demon after demon after demon say, I don't want to go there. Don't send me there. So Again, they don't want to go there. I think that's the best place that we can send them is to go into the abyss. Again, those verses are Luke 8, 31. They beg Jesus, do not send us to the abyss. Romans 10, 7, Revelation 17, Revelation 20, Revelation chapter 9. All those places you can find out about the abyss. abyss. Now, Jesus did allow demons to go into pigs, but this was one instance and we shouldn't make a practice of it, okay? So don't be trying to send demons into your neighbor's cat or your neighbor's dog, none of that. This is not a pattern of scripture. This is a one-time occurrence. We don't know why he allowed them to go into the pigs. I know there's a lot of theories. I've read the books. I know there's a lot of different ways we can preach that, but I wouldn't command a demon to go into an animal. It's not a pattern of scripture. Now, oftentimes demons do leave out of the mouth. So when doing deliverance, commonly they're going to come out of the mouth. Remember, we're spiritual houses according to Jesus. The eyes are the window. So if the eyes are the window, then the mouth is, I, I believe, the front door of the house. So they leave right out the front door. You're going to see this gagging, vomiting. Now, what is up with the gagging, vomiting, Isaiah? Why do people gag? Why do they vomit when they're getting delivered? Explain this to me. It's not that the demons throwing up and the throw up has a demon in it. It's that when the demon's coming out of the mouth, depending obviously on the, the rank of the demon, the power of the demon, how many demons there are, it's a natural gag reflex to gag because the demon's coming out of your throat. So that's why people throw up. It's a gag reflex. It's not the demon's not in the throw up. The de they're throwing up because the demon's coming out of their mouth and their body's responding as a gag reflex. Now it is biblical. The Bible says the demon shrieked out of them. We just saw that in Mark 1. Acts chapter 8, the Bible says, and the people were screaming as unclean spirits left them. So it's very biblical for them to be, for someone to be screaming as the demons leave. And a lot of times you'll see in our videos, and you'll see this as you do deliverance, the person will be screaming bloody murder as the demons leaving them. So if a person screams for like three minutes at once, a loud scream, you can conclude that demons are leaving right there. But yes, burping, yawning, vomiting. These are all symptoms, all signs. The member of the boy at the Mount Transfiguration, I've taught on all these, so I'm not going to go through too much recap. He was convulsing. They thought he was dead, the Bible says. He fell as if he was dead. He was foaming at the mouth, and it was a demon being cast out of him. So these are all things that happened. Mark 9, 26 says, then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into a violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead, and a murmur ran through the crowd saying, the boy's dead, okay? So Mark 9, 26, convulsions, spirit screaming the boy seemed to be dead another common thing when a demon leaves is the person will fall over lifeless or limp and then they'll come to that's again all goes back to mark 9 26 the person will be lifeless but usually they will scream as well that's found in acts chapter 8 verse 7 this is what the bible says already acts 8 7 for unclean spirits for unclean spirits listen to this crying with a loud voice came out of many that were demonized with them and many who were lame and paralyzed were healed. So for the unclean spirits were crying with a loud voice coming out of many that were demonized. So again, screaming, demons there, um, that's going to happen, okay? So that was number four. 
What was number four again? It was bind the demons in Jesus' name. Make sure you're always using the name of Jesus. I have an entire video on using the name of Jesus. Command them to go into the abyss. Number five, if the demon doesn't leave, find out why the demon won't leave. That's number five. And again, I've made this a new list, very basic. If they don't leave, find out why. Now, there's a couple reasons why a demon might not leave. They could have legal consent to be there. They could be holding out on you, and that basically means they're going to try to withstand you. So they're going to try to outlast you. They believe you're going to quit before they quit, and you need to put pressure. I had a demon just last weekend saying, I'm not leaving. You're not powerful. I'll never leave. And three minutes later, it was screaming out of the person. So don't, don't believe the lies when demons are speaking out of the person saying, we're not going to leave. You have no power. We're more powerful than you. They're lying. It's literally what they do. So make sure that you don't believe that. It could also be unforgiveness. Now, when the demon doesn't leave, if the demon's still there and you're commanding it, you're doing everything I told you, then it's okay to engage in conversation. But just remember, this is, con this is not conversation, this is interrogation. This is not conversation, this is confrontation. So Jesus did it in Mark 5. Jesus, the Bible said, had been commanding the demon to leave. The demon didn't leave. And so Jesus said, what is your name? So why did Jesus talk to the demon? Because the demon didn't listen to Jesus. It was disobedient. Now, don't be shocked when the demons don't listen to you. They also didn't listen to Jesus in Mark 5, but Jesus said, what is your name? So it is okay to ask the demon its name and to ask the demon if it has a legal right. Now, if the demon says, I have no legal right to be there, then you need to just keep putting pressure on it and keep commanding. Don't give up after five minutes, okay? Now there's some, let me give you a list of helpful reasons to talk to demons in deliverance. Again, only in deliverance. Number one, they could reveal other demons that are hiding. Number two, the demons, they'll reveal demons that are there. Um, they could also reveal why they came and why they won't leave. They could also reveal objects that the demons are attached to. They could reveal how long they've been there. They could reveal their name, helping you understand the function and the strategy. Um, so just know that there's a lot of useful things demons can tell you. And I know a lot of you are gonna say, well, brother, demons lie. And I've heard this a million times. I'm gonna blow your mind right now, okay? For all of you that say demons lie, don't talk to them, they never tell the truth. Let me blow your mind with this, okay? There's not one verse in the entire Bible where a demon lied. Not one. There's not one verse. So for all of you that say demons just gonna lie, they never tell the truth, every time a demon spoke in scripture, it actually told the truth. So don't think just because you've heard it from pastor to pastor, demons lie, don't talk to them. They can lie, but oftentimes you're going to see through experience, again, this is not head knowledge, this is experience, that demons actually oftentimes tell the truth because they want to leave. So again, not one verse in the entire Bible where a demon actually lied. Every time a demon spoke, it actually told the truth. It, when it talked about Jesus, when it talked about being tormented, when it talked about being judged, the demons always told the truth. Even the girl that was demonized in Acts chapter 16, even the demon told the truth, saying these are men of God preaching the way. So don't don't just follow teachings where people say demons are liars. Don't believe them. They do lie. I mean, they are liars, but oftentimes you're going to see that they don't actually lie. You can also ask angels to help you. I have an entire video on this. Angels will help you in deliverance. That's another way. Okay, number six. So now the demon's gone. You found out it was unforgiveness. The person forgave. You found out there was a legal right. You renounced the legal right. You found out why the demon won't leave. If there's no reason why it's not leaving, just keep commanding and keep putting pressure on it. Number six, after the demons are left or you've suspected they've left, very important, number six, go back and make sure everything is gone. Check two to three more times. Demons are incredibly good at hiding. So number six, Check a couple more times to make sure nothing's there. Now, how would I do that? It's very simple. You call out the names of the demons that you think have left, okay? So you say, spirit of, if you think the spirit of lust has left the person, then you'd say, I command that spirit of lust to leave in Jesus' name. You have no power. You have no authority. You just keep commanding it and see if the person responds. See if the demon responds. Now, before the person was hearing voices, they were manifesting. Now, they say, I don't feel anything. I don't hear anything. And it's important through the deliverance, you're engaging with the person being delivered because they know more than you. They're the one being delivered. So you need to ask them, did you feel anything? Did you hear anything? So that's one way to do it. The other way is you could ask the Holy Spirit for a word of knowledge. Holy Spirit, give me a word of knowledge. Is there any demons left? And the Holy Spirit oftentimes, remember the Holy Spirit knows everything, will tell you if there's any demons left. Another thing you can do is look for body language. Look for body language showing there's something there. They might say, oh, I don't feel anything, but then their eye starts twitching or they're looking at you and you can tell you can see a demon in their eye or they start growling or they start you know, twitching real bad or their, their hands shaking real crazy. That could be a sign of a demon. So look for body language. 
Ask the Holy Spirit for words of knowledge. Call the demons out that you know that you've written down or you know were there before. And also, here's another tip for you. Look the person in the eye and see if you can detect anything. Because remember, the eyes are the window to the soul. Oftentimes, when you look the person in the eye, you can see a demon there or you can detect or you can discern whether there's actually a demon there. Okay. So that's very important to check through many, many times in deliverance. You'll be at the very end and you'll go through to recheck if anything's there and the person rah, starts manifesting again and you're back at it round one and you start casting up more demons. So don't be afraid to do that. Um, step number seven, this is the final step for tonight and the most important step now that the demons are gone. I hope these are very simple steps that have helped you guys. Number seven is pray the Holy Spirit fills them and protects them. This is the most important part. Remember, the demons have left the house. There's an empty space, Jesus said. Who fills the empty space? You guessed it, the Holy Spirit. So you need to pray that the Holy Spirit would fill them so that that house was no longer empty, but it's filled and those demons don't come back. And that's where you pray the anointing and you pray that they get full of the Holy Spirit and they get free, okay? Those are the seven steps. 